Tom Sawyer? What are you doing so far from home? Rush is playing here tonight. They wrote a song about me. Oh. Well, I'm looking for my friend, Jim. Huck, great news. I'm free. You are? That's awesome. When did that happen? It's just being revealed now, but it happened hundreds of pages ago. Oh. Huh. Weird. So, uh, what's left to do? I'll tell you what. Rush concert! <laughs> Hey, I'm Mark Twain. Pretty cool book, huh? Ladies and gentlemen, pack your bags and grab your muskets. It is time for the most western edition of Nick's nonfiction you have ever heard. I'm your host, comic Nick Munez. Mark Twain is bringing us along, roughing it for this week's edition. Personal favorite topic from a personal favorite author. This guy is giving us an even-keeled interpretation on all of the developing cultures of the American West. You've got savages trying to protect their land, Americans trying to claim their own manifest destiny, and Oriental settlers claiming all the best mines in the mountains. This nuanced man, Mark Twain, wasn't just out there trying to get rich, he's out there to see the bloodshed. Twain's quoted saying, God created war so that men can learn geography. This is like Teddy Roosevelt Rough Rider period. These men lived harder than 99% of men today have ever experienced a single day. On the journey, you know, Mark Twain's gonna find himself as a writer. He gets uh, parts on a satirical essayist for local papers. Is this guy really as hard as we think he is? Samuel Clemens is his real name. If he was alive today, what would be his favorite chain of restaurants? Langhorn Steakhouse. Mark is a man of many names, might be too inside for you. This guy stopped at Salt Lake City. He watched the blow up of the Mormon scene. He met Brigham Young face to face, who was not a fan of Mark Twain. There's tons of great quotes. And you know that's uh, Kevin Spacey's favorite college, right? Brigham Young. He crossed a 40 mile desert without water. Mark Twain's stagecoach driver is killed in the middle of the night. This is the trip of a lifetime. Some people call Mark Twain the first stand-up comedian. He's the first travel writer, maybe. Most of all, this book, it's an in-depth layout of the American West and how to survive it. You know, this is like the best Discovery Channel show ever. Get out of here, Bear Grylls. Les Stroud, you could take a day off looking for Bigfoot. Mark Twain is showing us the actual ins and outs, how to pan for gold. There's a Hallmark movie adaptation, so if you're into time pieces, go check that out. You gotta read the Twain book as it is, and we've got tons of quotes today. He's got a rhythm and humorous details. Like, he's quoted saying, uh, When the world is ending, I want to be in Kentucky. They're always 20 years behind everything. <laughs> he invented humor, and he was brave enough to get on stage and let the silence speak for itself. His writing was good enough where the audience reacted back. This guy... Like even a Shakespearean drama humor, they had to hide all of their jokes in terms of farts. Macbeth had a drunk friend who always had to lighten it up. Mark Twain can make light of the most deadly topics. He's quoted saying, Politicians and diapers must be changed often and for the same reasons. What is the difference between a taxidermist and a tax collector? The taxidermist takes only your skin. Civilization is the limitless multiplication of unnecessary necessities. A little deep on that last one. I've been trying to say on stage recently that I've invented unintentional minimalism. I'm just poor, I can't afford everything, but I tell people I'm a minimalist. <laughs> Twain already had that bit 150 years ago. I've been saying on this show I came out 150 years late to Colorado, the Wild West has been thoroughly priced out by the governors. Tons of characters we're going to learn about today. It's transcendent of time, this good of writing. I'll give you one more quote before we started. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. From being penniless in San Francisco to boat rides around Hawaii, today we are mainlining some true Americana. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Do worse than that if you don't stop squawking. I said, get the hell out of my house now! 
Oh, you son of a bitch! Hey! What? You gonna rob me? Is that it? <laughs> Mark Twain, about the author. There is no about the author. We already did the uh, Twain on the Brain video over on the Patreon. So please, people, go and get subscribed. Support the show. Great footage over there. You're getting the, the Great Reset. <laughs> I mean, that was an epic addition. There's the entire exposure of Jeffrey Epstein's child pedophilia ring on that page for a dollar. I mean, what are we doing here, people? Go check out Harry Schwant. The memes are great. And uh, you're going to get a good feeling of Mark Twain as a young man here. There's kind of two Twains authoring the book because he traveled in 1860 to 1867. And then this was published in 1871. So at some points when he's narrating, it's kind of like a 2020 hindsight. This is how I actually have a full formed opinion now about this thing. Really interesting. I'll guide you through the thing. And we're doing it in seven chapters, a 500 page book. How about one more ad before we get the show underway? Mark Twain here, filling in for Brian Griffin. I understand you children read my book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Yeah, I read it. Now, who can tell me... Bobby, stop screwing around back there. Who can tell me the significance of the carpetbaggers in my novel? Yeah, uh, they stood for corruption and greed. That's exactly right. Just like the presidency of James Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> he died in office. You kids are mighty smart. You must have a powerful good teacher. Well, I gotta catch my time steamboat back to the 1800s. Hey, sorry I'm late. Did I miss anything? Yeah, Captain Crunch was here. Didn't you pass him on the stairs? Well, I hope the rest of you kids learned something today. Yeah. Madams and gentlemen, welcome to the West. Mark Twain's Roughing It, Chapter 1, Stage 1. The year is 1861. Mark Twain's brother, Orion Clemens, is appointed the secretary of the Nevada Territory. They give him a month and a half to get out to the territory to claim his position. Twain is envious of his older brother, thinking of all the adventures he's going to have out in the West. He's thinking his little brother is going to get rich quick hitting a silver mine. He's quoted saying, maybe he'll get hanged or scalped and have ever such a fine time and write home and tell us about it and be a hero. You could see through young Mark Twain's rose-colored lenses, the West is a win-win. You go there and hit a silver vein and become instantly rich, or you get killed by a bunch of Indians in an epic battle, and the word travels back to your family, and you're a hero forever. Orion, his brother, was able to sense all the jealousy radiating off of Twain. He offers him to come along as a private secretary, so of course he accepts instantaneously. The brothers travel for six days by steamboat up the Missouri River to St. Louis. St. Joseph was the port that they were leaving from, and they uh, were doing an overland journey. You could go watch the PBS documentary. They have the entire buildup. It's like a 20-hour series, so you're going to have to watch that on twice speed. They arrive at St. Joseph. The brothers buy tickets. The coach is bound for Carson City, Nevada at $150 per head. They got a 25-pound limit. This is better than your recreational airline. Twain said he had to throw out his swallowtail coats, white kit gloves, and stovepipe hat. <laughs> what was he dressing for? The Queen's Ball? Twain says, We were reduced to war footing. My brother took along 10 pounds worth of books, including United States statues and an unabridged dictionary, not realizing he could buy these books out west. His brother might be the true patriot out here. He was bringing along a pocket constitution. The six host stage course leaves the states and it begins to cross the plains of Kansas. It's interesting. They don't even consider it America anymore. Twain was overwhelmed. He's like exhilarated. He says, my sense of emancipation from all sorts of cares and responsibilities was unbound. But think about it, being a young man and not even being in a country. <laughs> he considers this the most free he ever felt, freer than hanging out with Tom Sawyer as a little kid, making mischief. There were three other travelers crammed into this tiny stagecoach with 700 pounds of mail. 
It's a pretty cool way to travel. Every 10 miles, they like switch out the lead horse and drop out some mail, see some ghost towns. They converse all day, endless bumping. You're getting hemorrhoid sticking out of your butt. Traveling by horse, Twain is like, I'll never go back to normal seats after sitting on the mail. They got so sick and tired of wooden wheels that they just started sitting on people's love letters. Very nice. Another cart came along one day, had to fix them off in the middle of uh, Nebraska. You got to watch out for the dog towns, you know? If you're riding with a horse, you can't even go over some of the most clear-looking plains because they're infested with prairie dogs. So your horse will come along and twist its ankle. And he said this happened to them. They got stuck in Nebraska for a long time. While he was stuck there, Twain saw his first ever jackass rabbit. So the men took turns firing at it. No one was able to hit it. He said in Nebraska, The fire pits dug into the ground, staying warm all night and producing no smoke, which made for a very sociable campfire. You're doing the old Dakota fire hole. He's learning new methods to create a fire. We did this in the Bushcraft 101 book. You just make a macaroni-shaped hole in the ground, and your fire can sustain the highest winds. And you could also tell stories without... <laughs> you know, there's always one person around the fire. Why is the smoke following me? Yeah, that's what's happening. You just exposed your negativity bias to all of us. <laughs> he told a story around the campfire saying, you know, if we had camels in the American West, we'd be able to make it across the plains in a week. And nobody agrees with him, but he's like, I saw a camel when I was a boy. They could go for five days without having a drop of water. Some people agree. They're just debating nothingness around the fire. Twain dropped at the end there that the camel from the circus, they would feed newspaper clippings. So he said he began to stumble on statements that not even a camel could swallow with impunity. Twain's getting big laughs around the fire there. He's thinking the West is everything he expected to be. Tried to kill a jackrabbit that day. As they pass through more towns, Twain, he's getting this feeling that each has their own hierarchical system. So technically, they already left America. It feels socially similar to where he grew up. Twain said, Each level of the hierarchy seems to look down on the ones below it, with conductors feeling superior to drivers, who in turn feel superior to the station workers. It's interesting that he's like observing where he is as a foreign culture, even though it is the same culture he grew up in. I don't know. He just doesn't realize it, and he kind of writes about it from both points of view. End of the chapter here. They're on this 1,900-mile route. Starts in Missouri, ends in California. Each 250 miles, they call it a division, and it's overseen by an agent. This guy is authorized to carry out a ton of variety of tasks by the drivers. So it really is this little hierarchy system that he's observing. I guess that's good organization. It has to be militant. We're conquering the West with tarp tents. This is an amazing feat of humanity, Mark. Twain just probably had to pee really bad one day on the wagon, and the guy running the coach was like, it stops for nothing. We got to make it on schedule. Hold your pissing, little boy. So Twain's a little butt hurt here. He starts to get a taste of the hardships of the West. One of the upcoming divisions, those 250-mile switch-outs, The coach horses that they had got switched out for mules. The passengers find themselves like paying for breakfast. One day they ate rotten bacon. They wouldn't even feed this stuff to the army, so they're just eating scraps. Twain's request for coffee is scoffed at day after day. They're like, have you looked around the corner? You know there's a Starbucks around the block. At one inn, he said... There was a broken mirror and half a filthy comb available for use, but the towel, a hoary blue woolen shirt, is reserved for the station keeper, coach driver, and coach conductor only. If you paid for a better ticket, you get to use the cum rag they're calling a towel. (laughs) Like, the front desk is not going to run more towels to your tent, Mark. He said, uh, breaking the fourth wall. While it takes the stagecoach 56 hours to reach the North Platte, in eight years, a train will be able to make this journey in 15 hours. This is before the Transcontinental Railroad. It's going to be some hardship. Things are changing fast for Twain. 
And we're going to start hearing about the Indians because the horror stories are kicking up at all these inns. Everybody's heard whispers. And Twain starts comparing the natives to coyotes. He saw his first coyote out there in Nebraska, and he said they're long, slim, sick, and sorry-looking skeletons, living, breathing allegories of want. Has some disdain for the savages. He'll learn throughout the book it's more of a free-for-all out there than there are actual teams. The coach finally arrives at Overland City. Mark Twain says the strangest, quaintest, funniest frontier town that our untraveled eyes had ever stared at and been astonished with. Great language. Let's move along to chapter two, Heart of the West. Another division of the trip complete. Now in Overland City, the stagecoach is changed out for a mud wagon. This thing breaks down the following day. The passengers are invited on horseback to a buffalo hunt. Twain's the first one to say yes. And the hunt is led by a really ornery character. This guy's name is George Bemis. Twain said, He is obviously a big talker who embellishes the facts with enticing impossibilities. He tells this tale of riding on his horse away from a cougar that was chasing them. When the cougar finally caught up to them, the horse got scared, and he bucked George Bemis 400 yards into the air. He flew away to safety, watching the horse and the cougar battle it out, and he lands in a tree. Twain says aside, not to the group, A horse can't kick a saddle 400 yards in the air, nor is it probable that the saddle would land precisely in George Bemis's tree. He also told a story about a buffalo. And there was like a big tale. The buffalo one week would be teasing George Bemis, and he would chase it for miles and miles away from his plot. He wouldn't get lucky, and then he'd see the same buffalo a week later. His elusive little creature one day, shouldn't be saying little, was in his tree. He thinks it had it out for him. He was becoming the hunted. So George Bemis said the buffalo one day jumped down on him from his tree and he was able to slit the buffalo's neck with his bowie knife before it trampled him to death. <laughs> Everyone is aghast around the fire. This is finally enough of a tall tale for Twain where he chimes in. Hey, Bemis, that tree must have had some pretty thick branches to be able to hold up a buffalo. Twain said, As the stories went on, my companioners knew that Bemis was full of hot air. Although they would goad him with their doubting queries, they allowed the story to unfold for its entertainment value. You'll see as they go for the West, the characters get bigger and more out of hand, and the people still just buy into it because there's no TV. <laughs> Author Twain, he's commenting from the future. He met a guy in Thailand this gentleman, Eckhart, was an Englishman. He was famous for the number, ingenuity, and imposing magnitude of his lies. <laughs> Imagine the people you must meet. There's like Nederland, this weird, like half unincorporated town near Boulder, Colorado, and it's just hill people. There's obviously no zoning board in this town. Every house looks like a meth head. Walter White lives there. But these people, if you ever stop at the coffee shop, all of them have apparently met an alien and seen a UFO. <laughs> or have you ever stayed at a hostel? Maybe more of a relatable reference. You are going to meet a compulsive liar. And it livens things up. you got to have one of these people in the group when you're in a foreign city and you know nobody. Yeah, I was just in Bali last week. Then I stopped over in London and Paris on my way here today. You are clearly homeless. <laughs> Hostels, I swear to God, you'll meet some of the wildest people. Apparently the Wild West. They went on that unsuccessful hunt with George Bemis. The passengers await for their mud cart to be fixed. And uh, then the Pony Express came by. So this was the first time Mark Twain ever got to see something very competent out in the West. You know, he's now meeting liars and he's a little bit disenchanted. Now he finally sees these men who like commit themselves to being under 150 pounds these tiny jockeys he said ride like the wind day and night the pony express i'm sure you've heard about they go 2,000 miles in eight days you don't even sit down so you're not getting butt sores these guys do a squat across the continent of north america i think the pony express is like as badass as the first guy that ran the marathon in sparta 
or the French, they have their cute little bike race. We should have an American event where it's an eight-day cross-country horse race. The first one to deliver a letter wins. New Lance Armstrong, he's going to blood dope the horse. All the travelers get excited when they see one of the Pony Express riders blow by them. Imagine you got this excited every time a mailman passed you. <laughs> now that they're on the express route, they passed the 1856 Mail Massacre. Not to be confused with the Malai Massacre. 1856, a bunch of Indians sabotaged one of the mail trade routes. And so they seized important letters and dozens of mailmen died. I guess it's kind of bad, you know, there were love letters going across the continent. And the savages, they're lobbing rocks at men who are creating the world's first internet, the first fast communication. You know what? The mail massacre is actually pretty bad. I should find out where that is. Go pay my respects. It's midnight. They're camping outside there, and they're awoken by a vile shriek. Mark Twain hears a club beating on the outside of the wagon. So one of the drivers starts whipping the horses, and he's screaming out loud, Kill it like a dog! Come on, giddy up! All the people inside the wagon are cowering in fear. This is five nights at Freddy's, uh, the Oregon Trail Virgin. Virgin. It could be anything out there. A deranged prospector, an Indian, a savage, a skinwalker. Twain said two shots were fired outside. Then the wagon and the driver took off even faster. He said, quote, We fed on that mystery the rest of the night as the conductor would not stop to tell us what had occurred. In the morning, they learned they were stopped because they were at a station, and the attack was in fact carried out by a group of outlaws, not Indians. That's how the rumors get started. They stopped at a gas station, and <laughs> one of the drivers got killed by a trucker. And, like, this is probably just inserted by Mark Twain to say, hey, my stories are real. Sometimes I'm in danger. I'm not George Bemis out here getting bucked off a horse 400 yards into the air. Interesting to see how those stories really do get started. Group of outlaws, truck stops. You wonder how the prostitutes are at those ancient... <laughs> So they're like crossing the uh, line into Wyoming now. And there's even more rumors about the savages. I think they called it savage country at this point. And they start hearing words of a notorious outlaw named Slade. Mark Twain says he was a man whose heart and hands and souls were steeped in the blood of offenders against his dignity. Most of the characters are just mentioned in passing throughout this book. Mark actually took a while to give an analysis of Slade here. He goes, out west, there's a different compass of morality. You know, a modern-day city gangster wouldn't last a day in the Old West. I don't even think Al Capone, you can't launder money out west. You actually got to get your boots dirty. <laughs> this compass of morality. Have you ever seen that movie Megamind? It's about villains and supervillains. So if you watch, like, those old uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, this is a big theme out in the west. Slade... This outlaw, he never shot the sheriff himself. He actually started his career as a young cowboy, wrangling up bad dudes for local sheriffs. And then there was a new, younger sharpshooter in town. Slade retreats further and further into Wyoming. He's resenting all the prostitutes who will no longer have him. Slade starts killing to kill. The rumors keep going on. Slade, he took on a wife and an adopted orphan boy. And on the other hand, you know, like he would torture his victims for pleasure before he killed them. However, he adopted an orphan. It's adding to the palette of colors, this guy. Twain says he's a conundrum because he always leaves financial restitution behind. If he kills your husband because your husband's a bank robber, he's going to leave some money for the family behind. Some people don't even know if he's alive. This could be like robbed at a truck station, urban legend. Some people say that Slade was hanged in Montana. So there's just uh, sheriffs that are blaming crime on him to make it so their town isn't as scary. I don't know if the whole uh, point of this part of the book was to try and make you feel empathy for a killer. If so, Mark Twain's proving himself a great writer here because Slade is pretty badass. He said he would go to a saloon, fight a dozen men, and then pay for their bar tab. 
This guy is one of the better vigilantes out west. Twain said, on one hand, many cowardly villains had seemed outwardly brave when they were executed. There was no figuring out this conundrum. People said that he squealed like a baby when he was killed, and some people said that he put the bag over his head and was hung like a man. Twain is realizing the people with the best legacy can even change over time and be looked at as villains. Go watch Megamind. <laughs> They're passing Cheyenne, Wyoming here, wrapping up. They overtook several wagon trains of immigrants, Twain is saying. We were in the heart of the Rocky Mountains now. He said it occurred to me for the first time ever that seeing really is believing. He wrote the passes seem like a suspension bridge in the clouds with deep valleys and plains below. He like rode past a mass grave of horse and oxen, probably like the site of an old cattle jump. He said these bones emit an eerie phosphorescent glow. What? Nuclear waste sites decomposing the Old West? I didn't think that happened. Heart of the West here. These guys are 10 days from Salt Lake City. And a fight breaks out between 400 U.S. soldiers and Native Americans. Unfortunately, they weren't there for the actual day of the fight. It was in Green River. And they pass over it the following day, see a bunch of bodies... They're in town safe. Green River is a wild place. I've driven through it several times, stayed in a motel there. I think it'd be a nicer place if the Native Americans actually won this battle here. <laughs> it's not even that good of a piece of land for 400 people to die over. Rest in peace, their legacy lives on forever in the memoriam of a Super 8 motel. <laughs> Moving along to Chapter 3, Salt Lake. Twain called Salt Lake City. A peculiar institution of the Mormons, the capital of the only absolute monarchy in America. Twain called the place a fairyland. He felt like an observer when he was there, even more than out on the trail. Twain complained for multiple pages how there was only one saloon in the town. Brigham Young is said to have dozens of wives, hundreds of children. They all live together in what is called the Lion House. The Mormons all believe that bigger families will get you a higher standing in heaven. That's got to be one of the best religions ever. All you have to do is nut to get into heaven. Mr. Johnson was the first innkeeper they stop at in Salt Lake. A bunch of people had breakfast there. He's telling Twain how Brigham Young couldn't tell his own children apart. Mr. Johnson would have breakfast at the Lion's Den or whatever it was called. He's going, Brigham Young, this guy doesn't remember any of his wives' names. <laughs> He would often refer to his wives by number. Okay, Brigham Young friggin' rules. Johnson is going, uh, Brigham Young built a single bed for his 72 wives, <laughs> but the snoring was deafening, and they had to break up how many wives were in individual houses. That's a fucking awesome religious lore. For Christianity, I have to hear the story every single year about Jesus getting nailed to the cross. This guy tried to build the world's biggest bed and found out it's not practical because bitches be snoring. <laughs> you know, a bunch of girls talk in their sleep. You know, it would sound like um, the Guys We Fucked show. Just everybody, <laughs> I don't know. Twain shot back at Johnson saying, I don't think 72 wives would do it for me. The Mormon women have a bit more of a homely look than I would prefer. <laughs> Johnson gave Twain a version of the Mormon Bible. He called it a pretentious affair and so dull that it was chloroform in print. <laughs> Mark Twain should have annotated the Book of Mormon. Twain reads the Bible. On the first page he says, We know of surety that the work is true because God hath declared it unto us. Twain was like picking up on the appeal to ignorance over here. It was a pretty funny part of the book. You know, you can't prove that God doesn't exist, therefore he does exist. That's the antithesis of Logos, sir. You have broken brain. Mark Twain out here calling the Book of Mormon a heap of trash. He meets with Brigham Young, and he's going, This polygamy thing, when did it come into the Book of Mormon? I'm pretty sure Joseph Smith didn't add that. And this is when Brigham Young immediately leave. <laughs> told him, like, you're moving through town, right? I don't want to have to keep looking out for your name in the papers, Mr. Twain. They were at odds from the start. It's kind of like Scientology 
on the biggest scale ever. Back in the 1800s, they had their own city. That You just got to find a guy that can write good fiction, Joseph Smith, and then a con man who is Brigham Young to spread it. And in the case of Scientology, you got L. Ron Hubbard, who wrote the most fiction ever of any human. And then you get the con man, David Miskovich, to go recruit celebrities like Tom Cruise or <laughs> Richard Gere and put a gerbil up his ass. <laughs> Brigham Young was the Tom Cruise of his time. If Twain had access to triple threat actors, I bet he could have either started his own religion or made his own South Park Book of Mormon Broadway play. This guy had great critical commentary on the Mormon Bible. That would have been a bestseller. Wouldn't have had a publisher. Brigham Young ushers these guys out of town. Only one saloon I'd get out of there quick, too. Twain is going, uh, we passed the site of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. This was a big Indian versus Mormon site. And so the Mormons are naturally distrustful of anybody who's not part of their community. He's glad to be out of that mini metropolis, felt cramped up. Mark Twain, quote, the smallest coin in Salt Lake City is the quarter, and everything costs at least that much. This place has been commercialized since the 1860s. He gets to the outer mining towns. He's meeting the hardest working folk he's ever seen. The same way Mark Twain looked down on the immigrants on the trail, all of the miners looked down on him. He said that these people think that Yankees can't swear properly. <laughs> they're in the final stretches of western Utah here, about to go into Arizona, and they're going like 70 miles with no water. Twain wrote with an exclamation point here, rarely uses them. This was fine, novel, romantic, dramatically adventurous. This indeed was worth living for, worth traveling for. Middle of August, <laughs> like the summer, and they're going two and a half miles per hour through deserts. Their lips are cracking, their noses are bleeding. They finally arrive at what's called the Rocky Canyon and encounter Quote, the wretchedest type of mankind I had ever seen, Twain says. They're dirty, sneaky beggars who eat scraps that hogs wouldn't touch and make no contributions to society. These were the go shoot Indians, mostly for storytelling. And it's probably just to be some more contrast going from the big city devolving further and further as they go out west. They're in the great American desert. It's proper Nevada at this point. I guess that's where that uh, canyon is. And the entire length of Nevada is desert leading up to Lake Tahoe. This is where Carson City, the historic site, is. Big old amount of mining back in the day. Mark Twain about to go take the pontoon boat out on Lake Tahoe. And the last stretches of the desert, they f come across a guy that's dying of dehydration. They give him a bunch of brandy to bring him back to life. Of course, this makes him more dehydrated. In his final moments before he passes, he tells him the tale of the Greeley. <laughs> it's like some other outlaw. And it's very differing from the other people that he's been hearing the tale of the Greeley from. So he's like, I don't know who to trust. I might as well make my own word out here. It's going to end the chapter and move us to number four, Mine Struggle. Maybe 40 miles from Lake Tahoe, the boys pull up to Carson City as the stagecoach's final destination. Carson City, it's the home of Johnny Carson. You have to do five minutes at the top of every time you come home. They're introduced to this guy, Harris. He excuses himself mid-sentence to start a gunfight with a rival. They're in the main stretch of this western town, and this guy immediately calls out their new friend, Harris. Hey, you, Harris, I'm a calling you out, wearing iron. <laughs> Harris gets shot and rides home on his horse with blood leaking out of several wounds. Twain makes a joke. Hey, I don't think we're going to know Harris for that much long after all. <laughs> Breaking the tension after a duel. That is a comedic moment. Right on cue, following the duel, Twain says the Washo Zephyr shows up. This is a large wind that kicks up an enormous amount of dust every day at 2 p.m. What? Twain's like, I made it to Cowboy Town. This is what I pictured the Wild West. He got to see 
two people shoot off each other's fingers and then a dust bowl come through within 30 minutes. Mark Twain and his brother, they get put up at the governor's estate. This is proper Nevada. They are tasked with surveying deeds for the first week. So they just walk around the town and get a feel for the land. Mark Twain is stuck in dormitory-style housing with, like, 14 bunks in a room. His brother gets a room considered to be fancy because it has a rug and a wash basin. The morning of, like, the eighth day, the governor directs the men to survey the land nearby in hopes of building a railroad. So there's no direct orders. It's just a group of men who want to hold political power in Carson. Remember how the book started? They promised <laughs> uh, Orion Clemens he was going to be the secretary of Nevada. And he shows up and it's just an opportunity to become the secretary. It's not a guarantee. It's basically like politician boot camp. You know, Jefferson, Washington, they were all land surveyors. And there's 14 guys living in one house. This is like if you fucking stuck CNN's squad in a house together, you got... AOC and Pelosi sharing a bunk. <laughs> they would have a pillow fights at the end of the night. I'm sure that Pelosi and AOC have the same bra size. Those chicks are both rocking some hangers. Wild West had a crap ratio. It was a straight up boys town. Twain was like, <laughs> my job is to keep all these people busy. I'm not aiming for the surveyor job. So what he would do in the CNN house he would bring tarantulas back <laughs> every day. He would just go out and collect wildlife and then let it loose in his cabin in the middle of the night. <laughs> These people are trying to actually get a job. <laughs> they traveled across the country and Twain's just making ruckus. He becomes a personal assistant in town to some old guy. He starts hiking with the boarding house men to Lake Tahoe once a week. It's a long-ass trip. But all these guys in the boarding house would just tell the governor that they're going to see how the best railroad would take place between Tahoe and Carson City. Twain was writing this was some of the best days of his 20s, just heading out there, camping all day, fishing and smoking tobacco. He goes, we would sleep outdoors in a climate so cold it could bring an Egyptian mummy back to life. <laughs> There's something about sleeping outside in the cold that can actually make you feel awake. And Mark Twain is wondering, did I really come all the way out west to be a personal secretary? He's going on these massive hikes and he's seeing these hidden lakes. He's going, how many more of these lakes are just out of my reach that are actually bearing gold that I'm not taking the time to go and look? Twain's just becoming eager. So he finally buys his own horse. And there's this stranger that convinces him to buy a genuine Mexican plug. This type of horse is known for its ability to buck. So he gets on it once, and the horse bucks him off and it runs away. Twain wrote the seller pointed a gun at him and told him, Hey, you better pay up and go catch your horse. Every second you spend laying there, your horse is a mile further away. <laughs> He's robbing him at gunpoint over some janky Mexican horse. Twain spends weeks trying to track down this thing, and obviously is not eventful. He crosses path, though, with Governor Nye in this time. This is the governor of Nevada, the biggest honcho in town. He was directly appointed by Lincoln to run the territory. Lincoln saw how good Governor Nye was at busting up the Mormon racket in some of the colonies, so he sent him out west to make sure that shit doesn't take over. Twain doesn't want to get into the politics himself, so he takes some um, time out of city. There were articles being written in local Carson City papers saying, Humboldt County, the richest mineral region upon God's footstool. So Mark Twain hires a couple men to go mine with him. They rent two horses and ride 200 miles to a place with a ton of processing minerals. Not trying to strike gold, just looking for a reliable route that they can go to and start making money. They load 800 pounds of provisions onto this horse carriage they rented. Turns out the horses were too dehydrated to push the wagon themselves. So these men had to push an 800-pound wagon 200 miles through a desert without water. I don't understand how these men are still alive. This is roughing it to the most extreme. This is the ultimate sled push. You ever go to a freaking football field? Those things are like 
10 pounds and it's hard to push it 100 yards. These men pushed a fucking an 800 pound sled across a desert. What? Twade's just like trying to get his own slice of the mining game and he's still conning himself one way or another. The papers are saying, you could go anywhere in Arizona, Humboldt County, and you're going to strike it big. What the papers don't tell you is if you go more than 50 miles outside of Carson City, all of the water is too salty to drink. <laughs> they said that's why they ran out of water. They had to abandon the provisions and come back a couple times. What the heck, bro? There's just straight up lies in these papers. If you listen to it, you will walk out into the desert and become dehydrated, hyponaturnia. Mark Twain leaves this city, goes to his new town of Unionville, known for mining. There's only 11 cabins there, and it's surrounded by these looming mountains. He says all the cabins are occupied, so for the time being, they had to have their makeshift tents put up out of canvas. Thought he hit big, followed up a stream that seemed desolate, because all the men for the mine were working for the corporation. He's just following up streams. Told a story about finding yellow shining rocks. His heart stopped. He saw the mountains immediately getting shorter. He was felt like he was taller. He goes over to these shining rocks, busts them open, and they're like squishy. Doesn't lose hope. He bags up 20 pounds of this crap, brings it back to the Unionville market, and they tell him, this is just granite. It's a load of mica. He got hit with the fucking fool's gold out here. There's still another hundred pounds of it. <laughs> so Mark Twain says he bags 20 pounds of it just in case he comes across a bigger fool than the gold itself. Twain said after this expedition, It is untrue to say that all that glitters is not gold. In reality, nothing that glitters is gold. Real mind gold is dull in color. What a quote. All these calls out west, Twain's realizing the calls are an appeal to ignorance. Just like the uh, <laughs> the Mormons, they're trying to tell you you don't know anything about God because he knows more than you. All of these t newspapers are saying, you're going to be the one that mines big. You're going to be the one that finds the gold. Twain goes to the next like evolution in the mining game. People trade away feet of their mining ventures for cash. So you buy a quarry and then just start renting it out to people who want to mine. You can see where like halfway through the book, Mark Twain has come full circle from this bright-eyed settler to some heavy-hearted con man. Or maybe it only took two months. He hires a couple more uh, miners to travel along with him. One of them is called Arkansas, a belligerent drunk who always wants to fight. Twain called him a classic desperado, spoiling for a fight and ready to do anything to get it. They start skipping on rent in these different mining towns, so they're just one-offing town to town and seeing if there's any potential. Arkansas would fight any landlord that tried to follow them out of town. This is risky. You could just get shot <laughs> anywhere in the West from our interpretation of it. Twain is trying to keep his own like Western karma in line. He said, I always left a few coins for courtesy whenever Arkansas used his brandished pair of scissors on an innkeeper. <laughs> is he a villain? It was a really cool story up here about a desert snowstorm. Mark and his four men were following around a railroad in hopes of getting lucky. That's not a bad move. Everybody's just traveling the trails. You could branch off, find some more stuff. Quick aside, I felt like Arkansas growing up as a kid playing on the railroads. If you didn't play on the railroads, you are not a patriot. There was this one spot in my hometown. It was maybe a quarter mile from the bridge down to these big lights they have on the railroad tracks. So this light is as tall as the bridge, maybe 30 feet high. Me and my friends would take turns climbing on it. And it was even more fun being on the top of the light when a train was going down the tracks. So I went up on top of it one time. I got lucky. It was my turn while the train was passing by. And I start urinating on the passing train from 30 feet above. On that quarter mile down the track bridge, I saw a cop start to drive by. And the cop car stops while driving on the bridge. <laughs> I definitely see a silhouette look down in our direction because he sees a silhouette of a boy on a 30-foot pole 
with a pea stream going down onto a train. I probably could have got electrocuted or something. I start climbing down. I did like the side ladder slide down all of the rungs like an action movie. Me and my friends beat it into the woods. <laughs> Never got caught. Definitely go pee on a train. That was a longer aside than I thought. Mark Twain was out here following the rails. Um, they got caught in a snowstorm one night. Twain wrote that the sun was setting. It was getting darker and they had to find water. <laughs> so they diverge from the railroad tracks and for two hours start going in circles as the snow gets harder and harder and turns into a whiteout. The snow doesn't let up. The men decide to hunker in for the night. While they're in their tarp tents, all of them think, there's no doubt we're going to die. This tiny fire we have isn't going to hold up, nor do we have enough wood to keep it going. He said for the first three hours, Mark Twain was unable to start a fire. This guy, <laughs> his bushcraft skills were not as good as his mining skills. One of the new guys, Ollendorf, that they were mining with, he was praying to God. He swore off of whiskey. Twain, quote, it was not for any selfish reason, but to make a thorough reform in his character. Some friggin' near-death experience, you know, changes people at the deepest level. Too bad he didn't change his name, Ollendorf. What the heck is that? Twain also swears to God. He's going, I will give up smoking tobacco if God lets us live through this snowstorm. Arkansas also chimes in while they're all making their promises and says, I will swear off of gambling. If God lets us live through the night. Lucky enough, they're all shivering. They didn't sleep for a wink. They wake up and Mark Twain gets a hankering, sneaks behind the tent and lights up his pipe. Behind the tent already is Ollendorf drinking whiskey out of his flask. And Arkansas is playing with his deck of cards back there. <laughs> One of the better scenes in the book. All these guys repented for their lives eight hours earlier. And they're doing their vices already in the AM. As a final try at mining here, Mark Twain and his companions, they are departing for Esmeralda, tagging along as Captain John Nye. That's the governor's brother. Nye gabs incessantly, Mark Twain says, on the 120-mile route, and he seems to know how to do everything from sewing to mending a broken leg. Guy has a knack for problem solvings. They go to inns with nasty managers, and Bill Nye has the best uh, Captain Nye, the science guy. He's got the best like reputation out in the West. Apparently, he saved a lady's life once in California and stopped her uh, runaway horse. Like everybody knows this guy's story. His trip to Esmeralda was the best time ever traveling with Nye because everything was compensated. They got the most luxurious rooms. People, he said, would give him better mining tips as well just because they trusted Bill Nye. Nye broke down the con behind the quartz mines to uh, Mark Twain here. He was like, these mines will test the most rare mineral they ever find and then put in the paper that test as the average. Mark Twain sees that the quartz mill that he was working at for a little while is like a, another get-rich-quick scheme. Yeah, you're allowed to earn commission, but the highest uh, rate car that's on the lot or type of quartz you're going to be able to sell is only so much. Twain hears about the marvelous Whitman cement mine, so he quits this, brings his men, thanks Bill Nye for all the traveling, and heads to the Whitman Trail. Twain was making steady wages at that quartz mine, and when he gets to the Whitman Trail, thinking he's going to hit it big, there's already three German outdoorsmen there who have been mining for several months. We learned in that salt book how the German people are the best miners in history. These people are like, when a boom happens, the people who have the previous skill are able to cash out. Like miners, this is a gold rush. They rush out there and they use their skills. Mark Twain didn't know how to light a fire in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, same thing with the stock market. If you're not trading beforehand, you're not going to magically get rich. At that Whitman Trail, it doesn't wind up having anything. It's basically been scavenged. On the way back, they stop at Mono Lake. And it's known for having the highest salt content of any American lake. Mark Twain is like, I just discovered the Dead Sea of America. Does this get me anything? 
gets you mono nucleosis. Twain is like giving up here on the mining at the end of the mine struggle chapter. And he made an aside about the gold, the real gold out in the West being what Captain Nye struck. That guy's reputation was as good as having a sack of gold on you. He got accommodated to the highest levels as a rich person would. Twain tells Nye when he returns to town, that lake that I found, you know, it has the highest lye content in America. We could be making shampoo and soap out of it. And Captain Nye gives him a little bit of a front for some good horses and a cart. He's like, bro, this could be your friggin' trade or whatever. Mark Twain, while he was out there, he lived off of seagull eggs. <laughs> and was like, this is, uh, yeah, this is going to be my gold mine. I'm laughing. If you've ever seen that one Western anthology, I don't remember what it's from. It's a mining story. But the whole twist in it is this guy finds this valley and it has a bunch of gold in it. However, on the first day when he's about to start mining, he steals a couple eggs from an owl. And this owl has no way to defend its nest against a human male. And he's like, what? How high can this bird count? It's all just supposed to be a good little Western allegory about stealing eggs from people who can't defend it themselves. Like these German men who went and mined it before anybody else. You're going to go there and shoot them in the back and steal their mine? Mark Twain is actually stealing eggs at Mono Lake, but maybe he's going to make this uh, soap trade work for himself. I wish I had the name so I could go suggest to that anthology. Western lore, it's the bestern. Chapter 5, lie after lie. Mark Twain calls his trade route here the most curious episode he had yet experienced during his slothful, valueless, heedless career. A couple months in while he's packing out lie, Twain's here that someone on a nearby Whitman trail struck gold. He's the closest person by to hear this rumor, so he grabs his pan and pickaxe and heads over to the trail. By the time he gets to the Whitman mine, there's a management company who has orders by the governor of the state to shut down the trail. It's like, unless you're the first one there, Twain's saying you're not going to get any gold, and you got to keep that secret to yourself. Whoever was on the Whitman trail, it's better as a secret than it is you know, trying to help everybody else, unfortunately. Twain recruits a new youngling he calls their Wild West foreman, and this kid's job is just to meander around as many miles as possible looking for gold. Mark Twain finding his own solace in that trade route through the seasons. He's able to still get that uh, anxiety out of his head. Well, I could be mining right now. He's paying a kid to go do it. He's spending countless nights talking about uh, San Francisco properties that he wants to buy. All of these other people on the lie trader saying that's the real golden city out here. <laughs> so there's still something to look forward to further west. Mark Twain almost roped this one chump in to buying a piece of his Whitman trail for $90,000. So remember how he held on to that fool's gold earlier on and then he learned about trading feet for your mind he's putting all these little scams together and he said this man was on the fence for a week and in this time i knew how it felt to be a bona fide millionaire <laughs> you know this is probably a cement mine but i'm just gonna tell this guy that it's full of quartz you either die a rube or live long enough to become a con man <laughs> mark Twain is just straight up being an unethical businessman out here he spends like couple of short chapters yearning on his boyhood years on the Mississippi. He wants to be a steamboat captain again. He's not happy with his jobs here. He's just saying this is how you have to make it to work out west. And news is scarce. Twain is wandering around the city looking for his own stories to contribute to the local paper. He starts just following around the neighborhood desperado until they get into a duel. So he's selling these stories to local papers. He's making a dime here and there, but he actually enjoys it. <laughs> like, the Desperado like Arkansas is a man who's just looking for a fight. A verbal argument will do it for him, or he'll take a duel if he could get his hands on one. And Train is like, these are the true interesting people that stories need to be written about. There was this other writer in town, 
Boggs, who takes to Twain's method of following around wackadoos. Quote, Boggs, a union reporter, had a tendency to drunkenness. Boggs was a part of the union, so he had access to uh, school records. And so this was his bread and butter. Week after week, he would just write about the best uh, kids in school. I guess wives would be super into this, right? It's like ye old Facebook. It's gossip, you know, whose kid has the best grades. <laughs> Moms are going to be the first ones to get lost in the metaverse. Twain and Boggs get hammered drunk together, and Twain steals all of his papers from the union. <laughs> Just stealing from fellow journalists. Evening the field, I guess. Twain gets a raise to $40 per week. He's rarely drawing out his salary because he's living off of bribe money from other people and still trading his stocks. Actually doing well for himself, but he wants to change his influence in the reporting community or whatever. He comments again on these exaggerations that the mines would publish. Vague reports of the mine tunnels, machinery and management never mentioning the main point of interest, the ore is possible value. Some of those mines would test only their best minerals, but if this mine didn't actually have any minerals of value, they would say, we have 50 machines and 200 men working here. Join the force. They're not actually producing anything. It's a lie of omission. It's still a lie. Boggs is like one of the fathers of yellow journalism out here. Meeting higher-ups, Twain is learning many of the claims, these mining claims, are never meant to be mined. These are solely being sold to one another as stocks. Like Mark Twain is thinking, maybe I will go and mine my own plots one day. <laughs> it's just a real estate investment. Twain is not only finding out about the corruption here, but as a reporter, he's finding out what leads. He finds out this next group of people, not just those drifter desperados. There's this group called the Nababs. These are knuckleheads who strike gold out of luck. People buy up the papers like candy when Mark Twain has a story about these because it gives you hope. You know, this guy won the lottery, so can I. <laughs> you know, in real life, when a guy wins a lottery in a small town, the suicide rate triples in that town. The Nababs probably went broke within a year of striking gold as well. Twain is going, all my stories must have a truthful spin to them. He said, each nabob either looked like a crooked cheat or an ignorant rube. He's going, yeah, these people did strike it big, but it's because he was a cheat. Or it's because this guy was so ignorant he was willing to mine until he dropped. Twain would also, like, he said he got greased up by other people for his writings in the paper. Deputy Marshal Jack Williams became the new sheriff in town, and he was basically in Mark Twain's pocket. The dirt Mark had on him, like Mark used to follow around this guy when he was a desperado, and Deputy Marshal Bat Jack once robbed the guy for $70 at gunpoint. That's not that much money back then. And to kill a man over that, you're a coward. You're a yeller belly. <laughs> and Mark Twain is a yellow journalist. This Deputy Jack Marshall, he says, you can kill as many men, start as many riots, and be held in high regards in death. He keeps telling Mark Twain, like, you are in control of my legacy. It's the papers that say how the deputy should be remembered, not how the deputy actually acts. They had in 1863 the flush season and, you know, the Comstock load we uh, read about in that previous book. Everybody's rushing to Nevada. Nevada, 1863 to 1870, they produced $20 million in billion per year. Bullion the mineral, billions and bullion. They said a silver-wise, a million dollars for every 800 residents. So everyone that moves there thinks, oh, there's a million dollars worth of silver waiting for me. And you know, this Comstock shaft is deep in the earth. People are taking all kinds of risks going down rope elevators. Twain wrote about these thousand-foot mine shafts. It is worth one's while to take the risk of descending into them. From the outside, one cannot see the great force a mountain exerts as it presses down on its own great weight. 
The vast masses of earth are splintered and broken timbers piled confusingly together. <laughs> A mountain's kind of heavy. What do you think is underneath that? There's all these crevices and cracks. It's a wild place to be underneath. After failing in the mines, Mark Twain is saying, I don't need to go try this thousand foot deep rappel into the earth. And all these uh, Chinamen start flooding Nevada at the time. He says they're becoming clothes washers. What is this, a racist book as well? He's talking about <laughs> Chinese immigrants coming over and opening up laundromats. Why don't you just say the N-word? Twain is happy he didn't move all the way from China to get scammed, but I think he's had enough of the lies at this point. Taking us to the next chapter, number six, Golden Coast. En route to the final destination, San Francisco, Twain describes... The grave and somber landscape of California with its monotonous conifer trees, imposing mountains, and sandy plains covered with vindictively straight grasses. Twain doesn't understand the West Coast hype here, saying, The lavish richness, the brilliant green, the infinite freshness makes an eastern landscape a vision of paradise itself. I think Mark Twain is a little bit worn out from his travels here two and a half years in. It might be infecting his perception a little bit. Or he's the ultimate contrarian. West Coast, best coast. He hates the monotonous conifer trees. In San Francisco, he says, There are eight months of cloudless sunny days, followed by four months of constant rain. Both wear on your nerves after a while. Weather was so dull that he said he found himself wishing for the earthquake to arrive. <laughs> he concedes the loveliness of the Sacramento Valley. He was going in the distance. There is winding icy mountains. The Pacific Railway had stunning sections you wouldn't believe. Fifteen years earlier, the Sacramento Valley, that was like the original gold rush, 1840s. He's seeing ghost towns that are 20 years old. And he's like, holy shit, where I was just spending my time in Nevada, even though it was blowing up because of Comstock load when I left, that's going to be a ghost town. I'm happy I'm not there for the death of it. Twain was writing how the only city that he thought had longevity was Salt Lake. And it was already corrupt to the bones from all the Mormons. He's got pretty low confidence here setting into San Francisco. And a lot of people arrived earlier than him. He knows how important it is to be on the front side of a trend. It's only been a couple weeks in the pubs when Twain has entirely judged the city as a waste of human potential. He said there were so few women. I once lined up for a chance to peek through a crack at a genuine live woman. A 165-year-old toothless woman flipping pancakes. This guy's spending all of his time trading his old mining stocks. He's commenting all the buildings being cracked. He's, again, saying this earthquake, if it doesn't happen soon, I think it's just happening slowly. I was thinking this is like an analogy for the stock market crash that's coming up, uh, and he's going to lose all of his mining stocks in that. He talks about it from his future point of view here. It's a crappy chapter, though, the Golden Coast. Not so golden after all. Learns to stay afloat selling small articles to all the local publications in San Francisco. Twain starts following around the most destitute, sad men in the city, listening for their stories. And he tries his hand at mining a little bit again. He goes out to Tulum. This man teaches Twain pocket mining, so you could just walk around the surface and like identify rocks that might have actual value. Adding to his repertoire of gig work here, also in Tulum, there was this magical cat. The name of the cat was Quartz. They would take this cat out on a hike and just let the cat out loose, and it would start, like, sniffing around areas, and it would start to poop in random places, so the men would start to mine underneath the cat's feces. And apparently the cat had the best record in terms of finding minerals. <laughs> People know how to read the land and find the pocket. Maybe it is just total luck. Twain isn't ready to f dedicate his life to following around cat poop. He heads back to the uh, Sacramento Union, who he was writing for, and maybe he strikes his biggest score yet. 
They put him on a job writing about the Sandwich Islands. Mr. Twain is getting an all-expenses-paid trip to Hawaii. Moving to Chapter 7, our final one, Cooked Islands. You would think Twain is going to show up ecstatic, out of his mind, ready to see the landscape. I guess the long boat ride must have taken it out of him. He's still cranky. Twain wrote, These enchanted islands have scorpions, mosquitoes, tarantulas, and poisonous centipedes that make it impossible to sit on the grass or get a good night's sleep. He described the dreamy coconut trees as feather dusters struck by lightning. They landed not far off of the site of an ancient heathen temple, you know, where sacrifices are offered up. He thinks he's landing on Cannibal Island. Goes into a lot of Hawaiian history here, which is Aztec as fuck. A bunch of temples, you know, made out of lava rocks, and they would praise to the lava gods, throw virgins into volcanoes and cut out people's heart. Twain said there was a king that would impale heads on hundred-yard fields. It's worse than France. <laughs> so you, maybe you shouldn't feel so bad about the USA taking over there. Kind of a nicer ruler, I would say. He wrote he was sick of poi, their indigenous food, after the first time he tried it. A lot of Hawaiian food includes gourds. I didn't know this. Pumpkins. The Hawaiian islands with all their trade routes. It's a real gourd of the flies over there. I need like an allowance of one egregious pun per chapter. We're getting towards the end here, you could tell. <laughs> Missionaries who came to the island, they outlawed the hula because it was too sexual of a dance. Mark Twain was saying, what, the coconut bras was too slutty for missionaries? Even though they're eating pumpkins, Hawaii is supposed to be this fertile land, so they display that through sexuality. You know, if you're going to exploit someone, all you got to do is change their behavior. It doesn't matter if you make them do the fucking hokey pokey or if you allow them to have two wives and you tell them God is telling you to do that. This is what we're getting at with Captain Cook here. And maybe with the Great Reset last week. <laughs> um, like uh, natural Hawaiians, they were polygamous and they praised the shark god. When the missionaries came, they made them monogamous and praise the sky human, exact opposite from the uh, pagans over in Utah who they gave them multiple religions. You know, all you have to do is change someone's behavior and then you can indoctrinate them. Twain sails from Honolulu to the Big Island and he's aboard this small schooner. He passes sugar plantations. It's reminding him of Louisiana. It's a little southern boy. He just misses his corner of the world at this point. On the schooner, there was this friend who taught him the story of Simon Erickson, an old Hawaiian who brainwashed local farmers, taught them Christianity, and banged their wives. Story as old as Christianity itself. To finish the trip, he goes to the execution site of Captain Cook. This is the guy who discovered the islands for the Western world, and with his technology, the natives thought he was a god. He shows up and gives them a compass. They actually thought that he was, like, descended from the clouds. Spend years banging the wives of the natives, just like Simon Erickson, until they got fed up. As the legend goes, the native Hawaiians cornered Captain Cook under a waterfall. As he tried to talk all them down, they attack Captain Cook one by one. He slays three of the natives, and then they all rush him. The natives realize that Captain Cook is a mortal man just like them. They execute him underneath the waterfall, burn his flesh, and hang his heart on display. Mark Twain said he sat on the stump of a coconut tree where they cut out the heart of Captain Cook and smoked his pipe and contemplated his journey. Sit down and reflect. This man just spent two and a half years in the most wild landscape of the past 200 years, maybe. He's thinking, you know, it's not as cool when one con man, David Erickson, tricks a tribe into thinking that he's God. What's impressive is when Captain Cook can show up and grift an entire chain of islands. Same with Brigham Young. He hated the guy, but what he was able to do... 
<laughs> is the highest level of human manipulation. It's definitely a spectacle, questionable morality. He's going the same fate that we see on the Hawaiian Islands is for sure going to be the fate of the Wild West. There's going to be these groups of empires that come and take over the islands, so there will be periods of freedom and periods of rulership. I'm saying these unincorporated towns of Nederland out in the hills of Colorado, if there is a bit of a quiver in the state legislation system, these people are on their own. <laughs> you know what I'm saying here? If um, somebody actually did dissolve the federal government, the West could become the West again. And that's something to look forward to. Twain saying the history of Hawaii, sometimes it's free, sometimes it's under ruthless dictatorship. That's just the flow of the history. And he got to see that at the end of his journey. Also learn about the best con man of all time, Captain Cook. Fucking apocalypse now that shit. Show up to Vietnam and convince everybody that you're a superhero. Uzi Vert said it. Touring I'm selling out shows and made a cult following like Jim Jones. I'd be putting all these Hawaiians on, trying to turn these slaves into motherfucking clones. <laughs> Twain. He's cooked from all of his travels. This guy found himself a career that suits him. He's ready to go right back in the USA. Has a quote about a volcanic explosion he saw at the end, which I thought summarized his journey nicely. It was the sublimest spectacle I ever witnessed, and I think the memory will remain with me always. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Mark Twain's Roughing It. I want to thank you all for taking a trip out west with me here in this edition of Nick's Nonfiction. Next week we have another good one. This is a Patreon-requested listener. Make sure to get over on that page because the request line is open. We are reading Sun Tzu's Art of War. Closing out January before we get sexual and thematic for the month of February. You know the deal, some Eastern philosophy, but this time we're getting tactical with it. Going over the most basic tactics of war. Always keep your back to the hill. Make sure to flank the enemy. Some really helpful stuff in there, things you can apply to your life. And we're going to set up themes for the future books like the War of Art, the Art of the Flea, many variations to come. Thank you guys for tuning in to another edition. I want to wish you safe travels for the rest of your journey, and we will be here week after week to keep you company. Nick Munez, signing off.